focus to support critical thinking and news and media literacy, News Literacy Project, a US-based nonprofit, designs tools for educators and the general public that offer the required skill set to participate in today's democratic societies and information landscape. Find out why interviewed Damas Reyes, NLP's ambassador in Europe. In this interview that follows, Damaso talked about the mission of the organization. We need to begin to change the way we teach our young people to deal with the world that they live in, to deal with the information landscape that they exist in, not the one that we grew up in, which is gone, which doesn't exist anymore, it's vanished. The importance of information. If we have poor information, we make poor decisions. The central role of facts. We have to understand what the hallmarks are of propaganda. You have to understand what the hallmarks are of a good, factual, reality-based opinion argument is. And the challenges the lack of news literacy poses. There are people who have weaponized information and it's easier to do than it ever was. Uh, and they're using it to manipulate segments of our society and causing great damage as they do it. And sometimes they're doing it for profit, sometimes they're doing it for ideology, sometimes they're doing it just to cause disruption and to see the world burn. Stay tuned. We start by asking Damaso whether News literacy and media literacy are two distinct concepts. Um, they're they're very closely related. Media literacy is a is a sort of a slightly broader concept, uh, whereas news literacy is typically focusing on how to understand, interpret, appreciate, question news based information. Media literacy, uh, as a field in general, talks about. Uh, how to do those things, how to critically assess, analyze, understand, interpret all information, all media information. Uh, so those are, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of the, the the difference between the two, although difference is probably even a strong word. It's just more of a focus, I think. The focus is on information quality. What is the challenge that the organization identified in the first place on that area? Um, our founder, Alan Miller, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning former journalist with the Los Angeles Times, uh, he was inspired to create uh, the organization after visiting uh, his daughter's school and coming and talking about his work as a journalist and realizing that these young citizens, these young future voters really didn't understand what journalism was, uh, didn't understand what the function of journalism was, didn't understand why it was important. Has the message or the scope changed when social media heavily influenced the information ecosystem? No, I think that even even uh, in the sort of early part of the the, the century, uh, which sounds kind of funny to say, the influence of what we would sort of call non-traditional channels of information uh, was still very strong. And so I think as the organization grew over the next five to 10 years, we began seeing more of that. But the ideas behind the work that uh, the News Literacy Project does work no matter sort of what information you're looking at. Categorizing information, understanding that different categories of information have different purposes, understanding who is creating this information or trying to understand who's creating this information and what purpose they have behind creating that information. And then being able to actually critically analyze and assess the actual claims uh, and evidence or lack thereof. Uh, those skills are universal and transportable. It's one of the reasons why I think uh, news literacy and media literacy is so successful is because it actually supports other parts of education, but also supports everything we do in life, everything, every choice we make, whether it's what uh, kind of cereal to buy or what restaurant to go to or where to take our vacation is based on information. And if we have poor information, we make poor decisions. Uh, so helping people to create a filter, create a matrix through which they can analyze information is kind of universal literacy in the 21st century. One of the things that I always 
say to people is that if you're not uh, information literate, if you can't critically analyze and understand information in the 21st century, you are functionally illiterate in the 21st century. You may be able to read and write and type and tweet, but if you can't understand the difference between a piece of news that's well reported and documented and a piece of opinion or uh, God forbid a conspiracy theory, you can't function fully in society the same way as in the last century, if you couldn't read and write, you couldn't function fully in society. It's not that you couldn't function at all, but you couldn't function to the same level. You couldn't participate in the same level. And we're seeing that now, uh, I think in very stark terms uh, in the 21st century, that information literacy, news literacy, media literacy are the essential definitions of literacy in an information age. Is information literacy related to journalism? Um, I think that journalism is a part of information literacy or news literacy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, ultimately, all of these, you know, different terms that I'm talking about, information literacy, news literacy, media literacy, obviously, they're all interrelated, but they're all based upon being able to understand information and analyze it. And ultimately, as a consumer of information, you want to be getting your information from high quality sources. It's not unlike uh, our dietary choices, right? I may uh, enjoy from time to time eating uh, a fast food hamburger, which is okay if I do it once a month or once every few months. If I do it every day, it's very bad for my body, right? Anything in excess is really, really bad. Information is, is much the same way. You want a balanced information diet, or as I would say, a balanced news diet. Do you think the journalists have done a good job explaining to the public what they do? Uh, no. <laughs> in, in a word, we, we have not. We're doing a better job than we uh, did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But the truth is, is that there was never a need to explain what we did or why it was important. Because, you know, for example, um, when I was a child, if I wanted to know, or I, when I was a student, if I wanted to know what happened yesterday... I only had a few channels of information. Uh, in some cases, literally, if you looked at what was on television, but um, I could ask somebody or I could pick up a newspaper or I could turn on the TV and maybe if I turn it on at the right time, I could find the news or turn on the radio. But I had to seek out information. Uh, today, obviously, I can pick up my phone and I can get an alert. I can go on Twitter. I can. I don't have to seek out information. Information is seeking me out. Uh, that's a pretty profound difference. So the amount of information available to anyone, <laughs> almost anywhere in the world, is vastly larger than when I was a student. So when I was a young person, when I was becoming a journalist, there were only a few sources of trustworthy information. Well, first, there were only a few sources of information full stop, and there were only a few sources of trustworthy information. So it was like either you read the newspaper and believe what they tell you, or you don't. Now, obviously, there are lots of alternative sources of information. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, for a long time, uh, many journalists did not recognize that their primacy, their central role in the information landscape was being eroded. So this idea that, hey, I'm a journalist, trust me, uh, was kind of the motto for our profession for you know, a better part of 100 years. And now more of us are recognizing that uh, we have to explain what we do, how we do, why we do it. Um, that a lot of the things that we think that everyone understands about our field is really not, people don't understand these things. They don't understand some of the choices that we make as journalists that to us are you know, obvious, but to someone not trained as a journalist seem completely opaque. So one of the things that, you know, I encourage and the News Literacy Project encourages is journalists to engage with the public, engage with young people. Uh, so the News Literacy Project um, does a series of professional development that's called News Lit Camps, which are uh, held pre-COVID at news organizations with journalists holding sessions, bringing in educators to these news organizations to talk to journalists about how they do what they do, why they do what they do, why it's important. And for most of the participants, 
it's the first and maybe only time they actually get to meet and talk to a journalist. So they actually get to talk about their concerns. They get to talk about the questions that they have and the questions that uh, their students have when it comes to trusting uh, the media or trusting the news media. So journalists have obviously a very important role to play in the information ecosystem, but we also have to understand that um, we have to make our argument. We have to make our case to the general public. People aren't going to trust us just by default, and they shouldn't. They should hold us as accountable. They should question us as much as they question other sources uh, of information because we're not perfect. Uh, and we have to win the trust of the public uh, every day. What about independent journalists? How do they build their trustworthiness? Well, I, I think what we're seeing with this new part of the news media ecosystem is we, we tend to see people from coming from very established places who have established followings uh, then going independent, uh, at least the ones who tend to be successful. So in theory, I think the, you know, the people who will be most successful uh, are people who uphold the standards of quality journalism, people who are trustworthy. I do fear, and I think, unfortunately, it is being borne out that some people are moving more into the world of opinion. They're moving more into the world of telling a subset of their of readers or viewers what they want to hear. Uh, and as journalists, that's not that shouldn't be the center of our job. Obviously, if we look in the world of Uh, cable TV news, if we look at the world of social media, telling people what they want is extremely popular and extremely profitable. But it can't be the center of information because not everything that I want to hear is everything that I need to know. That's an important thing for us to recognize. So I think as journalists, you know, I've spent my entire career as an independent journalist. So I understand and appreciate and think being an independent journalist is, is, a, is a great thing. Um, at the same time, I think that it's hard to hold yourself accountable and hold yourself to high standards than it is within an organization oftentimes because an organization has structure and it has safeguards. It's one of the reasons why large news organizations are seen as more trustworthy is because they have layers of institutional protection against wrongdoing that don't always work, unfortunately, but at least you know I know when I read something from the New York Times or The Guardian or the BBC or just Spiegel that n not just one person thought of this and look, wrote it and then published it. You know, there are layers of people who looked at it, hopefully assessed it critically, asked questions about it and did so to, on my behalf. My behalf is, is the reader and the viewer. And that's a, that's a good thing. Do young people respond to those traditional ways of uh established uh, media outlets? So in, in my experience, um, young people tend to see the information ecosystem as flat. They don't really um, give more weight or more value to what a journalist says or what a traditional news organization says versus what a social media influencer they might follow says. They tend to respond very strongly to confirmation bias. So if whoever they come across is saying something that they agree with or something that, that resonates with them, they'll tend to think of that source as uh, being a valuable source or, or a correct source. Uh, so a lot of the work we do uh, you know, in, in our work with young people and with educators working with young people is that try to help those young people understand that not all information is created equal that there might be information that really resonates with you that you instinctually agree with, but it may not be correct. Uh, and there are people out there who try to manipulate uh, that feeling that we have, that, that idea of confirmation bias, right? We're more likely to uh, agree with and seek out information that already confirms what we believe. So it's, I think the good thing is, at least that we've discovered, is that once you explain this to young people and you give them this sort of education and you give them these tools, they're very responsive to it. Uh, it's a lot easier, I think, to work with young people whose uh, information and media consumption habits haven't been set in stone for 20 or 30 years. They're still learning. They're still learning how to consume information. So if you explain that, hey, opinion can be 
good, but here are a bunch of ways in which people misuse information, right? So there are things we call logical fallacies. So if you see someone using uh, a straw man argument, for example, or you see someone um, using an ad hominem attack, that's a sign that this person doesn't have a strong argument that's based in fact, right? They're trying to appeal to your emotions. Maybe they're actually pushing propaganda. It's not even opinion. But you have to understand what the hallmarks are of propaganda. You have to understand what the hallmarks are of a good factual reality-based opinion argument is. And you have to understand why uh, news is different than even that, right? And why analysis is different and why entertainment and advertising are different. Because today, all of those categories of information are blurred. And it's really, really hard to tell if you're not trained the difference between news, opinion, advertising, propaganda, uh, entertainment. And if you don't have that information, right, if you don't, can't tell the difference between those categories, it's really, really easy for you to be manipulated by folks who understand those differences very clearly and are using them against you. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing information warfare on a pretty vast scale. Uh, and sometimes that's by corporations trying to manipulate you into buying their products or not buying their opponent's products. Sometimes it's by governments, uh, foreign or domestic, local or national. Uh, sometimes it's by trolls who just want to disrupt things. But there are people who have weaponized information and it's easier to do than it ever was during the Cold War. Uh, and they're using it to manipulate segments of our society and causing great damage as they do. And, and sometimes they're doing it for profit. Sometimes they're doing it for ideology. Sometimes they're doing it just to cause disruption and to see the world burn. Uh, but if you're protected against that, right, we're, we're in an era of a pandemic. If you're inoculated against that, you're far less likely to become a victim. In fact, you become empowered. Empowerment needs training. Uh, it's a process that takes time. Can you maybe share the process of NLP with us? So, you know, I think there's a reason why we call it news literacy or media literacy or information literacy. If you think about how long it took to learn whatever your native language is, right? So you learn to speak it, then you learn to write it, you learn to read it. But that takes years, right? We spend years in primary school and in secondary school learning and refining uh, these skills to the point where we're quite fluent in these things. And I think that uh, media literacy and news literacy is very similar. So for the News Literacy Project, their flagship product is something called Checkology. And it's an interactive uh, online virtual classroom that consists of more than 13 different lessons that focuses on different aspects of information and news literacy, everything from how to sort and categorize and understand different categories of information, like the difference between, say, news and opinion, uh, to what the standards of quality journalism are and how they work, uh, what the role uh, a free press plays in a democratic society, how citizens play a role in being watchdogs, uh, as well as how journalists do that. We have a lesson on uh, global press freedom um, in, in different countries and how the media works in different countries. Uh, we have a lesson that focuses on bias uh, and how to spot it and how to understand your own biases, as well as a lesson that focuses on algorithms uh, and how they can manipulate and change the, the information that we see. Uh, we also have a lesson that focuses on opinion and opinion-based arguments and how to spot those logical fallacies that are often used by folks who don't have uh, solid opinion-based arguments. So it really covers a wide variety of information about how to understand information. And it's designed to be used by educators or parents or anyone who works with young people uh, in the sense that you, you, know, you can pick different lessons depending on what subject matter you teach or what courses uh, you want to cover, and you can build your own lesson plan. Uh, and it's become very popular. Uh, we've got more than 25,000 teachers, I believe, uh, using it in uh, all 50 states in the United States and over 100 countries around the world. 
so to us, it's, it's sort of a testament to the need of, of educators for this kind of work. I think the, the biggest challenge that educators face is that they're not necessarily specialists in news or information literacy. So providing them with a very robust tool helps them introduce these concepts. What is that you personally value in this organization and you're part of it? Um, I actually first uh, got in touch with the News Literacy Project as a volunteer. So one of the things that uh, the organization does is it connects journalists with students who are studying news literacy. And so for several years uh, in person, when I happen to be in New York or virtually when I was working overseas, um, I would visit classrooms and talk to students about my work as a journalist and why journalism was important. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, as a journalist. And then uh, when I uh, returned to New York, I was looking uh, for a job and there was an opening with with this organization that I had been volunteering with. Uh, So for me, it was a very natural fit. If there's going to be a future to journalism, we have to uh, educate the next generation as to why journalism is important. If we're going to have a future in democracy, we have to educate the next generation that facts exist and are important. And they can be interpreted in many different ways, but we have to start from the point that there are things called facts uh, and they should be the basis of our opinions. They should be the basis of our conversations. And they're hopefully what can help us help lead us to uh, consensus. Uh, That's the way that democratic society should work. And as an organization, I think the News Literacy Project is committed to facts. It's committed to helping people understand the world around them. And as a journalist, uh, that appealed to me and and it still does. Where do you see NLP in the next five years? And what I'm trying to ask here is like, what are the biggest challenges and the opportunities for the organization? Well, as as much as the organization has grown uh, over, say, the past uh, five years that I've been associated with it, and it's it's grown in terms of staff size, uh, it's grown in terms of reach. Uh, When I first joined the organization, Checkology had just debuted, and it's gone from zero educators to tens of thousands around the world in uh, just a few short years. The the goal of the organization is to see Uh, news literacy embedded in the American educational system. Uh, I think it's also dedicated to see seeing uh, news literacy spread around the world. And obviously, there's a very, very long way to go with that. Um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Obviously, teachers and parents and legislators are increasingly concerned about misinformation and disinformation and are trying to find ways to counter it. We think that News literacy should be at the core of any approach to fighting misinformation, but it's still a relatively new field and it's still a relatively new concept. Uh, So it's, there's still a lot of friction and still a lot of resistance to adopting it. Um, And it needs to be adopted in a kind of centralized way. Uh, Misinformation and disinformation spread kind of like wildfire over the past uh, six years. When I was a young person, I didn't have to have anyone explain to me what the difference between news opinion and entertainment was. It was clear. There was no confusion. The news came on at 6.30. And between the segments of news, there were these advertisements that would try to sell me something. And after the news, uh, I would watch uh, Jeopardy. And Jeopardy was entertainment, right? It wasn't, there was no confusion to me as to which, I learned this by osmosis. Today, There are people and organizations and institutions trying to confuse you. They're putting out a piece of propaganda or opinion and calling it news and making it look like news and making it sound like news. Uh, There are people in the entertainment world who are trying to do that. There are people in the advertising world who are trying to do that. So when these lines are so blurred, how are you going to tell the difference? Well, if nobody teaches you what the differences are, you're not going to learn them on your own. And I think the biggest challenge that we face is that a lot of the adults, right, the parents, the teachers, the people who make the curriculums, the people who make the laws, because no one had to teach us what these differences was, because we learned them just by observing, because we lived literally in a different information age, we assume 
that young people live in the same type of age and no one should need to explain it to them because no one explains to us, this is uh, a huge fallacy. This is completely incorrect. In the last 20 years, the way we consume information and the amount of information that is available to us is hugely different. And we as adults, as parents, as teachers, as policymakers, need to accept that. And we need to begin to change the way we teach our young people to deal with the world that they live in, to deal with the information landscape that they exist in, not the one that we grew up in, which is gone, which doesn't exist anymore. It's vanished, right? We live in a completely different information landscape. So there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of challenge. Uh, getting adults, uh, parents, lawmakers to accept this is one of the advocacy challenges uh, that organizations like uh, NLP face. Uh, how can we access here in the Netherlands and in Europe NLP tools like uh, Checkology or the application uh, that you guys have in Formable? Uh, so anywhere, anyone, anyone in the world uh, can go to newslit.org. And that's the News Literacy Project's uh, main website. And there are tools and resources there, including for the general public. And uh, anyone can register for an account for free uh, for Checkology just by going to checkology.org. Unfortunately, uh, these tools are primarily in English. Uh, one of the things we're definitely uh, hoping to do is to create uh, different versions of Czechology in different languages. Uh, we do have one lesson uh, in Spanish, but that really, you know, means that we need to find partners in countries uh, who can uh, who can fund and, and uh, help us not just translate, but really uh, adapt these lessons. But if you happen to teach in an English language school or you're dealing with English proficient students, you can sign up for uh, for Czechology and you can use it with your students. And uh, I think you'll find it's really an incredibly robust platform and incredibly user designed platform. It's really designed for students uh, to, to engage them. And I think it's one of the best, not just because I've worked with the News Literacy Project, but I think within the landscape of tools uh, interactive tools, especially in, in within the media literacy landscape. I do think it, it is really the best. This was Damaso Reyes, News Literacy Project Ambassador in Europe, and I'm Elena Gola for Find Out Why. Mm -hmm.